I'm Lewis Friedberg, Executive Director of EdSource, to welcome you to this webinar, which we are holding uh, remotely, of course. The title is To the Extent Feasible, Strategies for Success with Distance Learning. And um, I think many of you may know, but some of you may not, not know that the, the origin of the title, To the Extent Feasible, that comes from Governor Newsom's executive order saying that school districts should do what they can to the extent feasible in terms of distance learning and uh, we are looking forward to a really uh, illuminating discussion about best practices not only from california but also from around the country before i turn over the webinar to john fensterwald and uh, incredible panel that we have assembled I just wanted to thank many of you out there who are working under really difficult conditions and uh, doing heroic work, uh, trying to reach children under really difficult circumstances. And um, several more weeks to go in the school year and then many unknowns in terms of the fall. So we're hoping this discussion will be useful to all of you. So with that, I want to turn over the proceedings to John. You know, it is exactly two months tomorrow. The governor Newsom issued an executive order ensuring that school districts and charter schools would get funding for the year as long as they continue to provide high quality learning opportunities, primarily distance learning, to, as he said, the extent feasible. The state has left it up to districts and charter schools to define high quality and what is feasible, and they have done so with great variation. Out of the gate, as you know, they started with far different degrees of readiness in terms of being able to provide students with a computer and internet access. But beyond that challenge, they've set different expectations for student learning and signed MOUs with teachers and staff, setting different work conditions and schedules. Some appear to have charged forward with great success. And we'll, we'll feature two of those uh, districts in a webinar later this month. We'll provide you more details when we have them but others have, have really struggled greatly. Since March, the Center for on Reinventing Public Education at the University of Washington has been following 100 school districts and charter organizations nationwide as they shifted from learning in the classrooms to learning in the living rooms. The center has compiled an impressive database on distance learning plans, instructional practices, learning schedules, and approaches to student engagement. Analysts Bree Dassault, Lane McKittrick, and Stephen Wilson from the center will share their most recent findings and conclusions. They will cite two districts and a charter management organization with what they consider exemplary approaches to distance learning. Bree is practitioner in residence at the center. She previously served as executive director of Green Dot Public Schools in Washington, D.C. and was a teacher and a principal. Stephen is senior fellow with the center. He is an author and founder of Ascend Charter Schools in Brooklyn. Lane is research analyst at the center where she works on projects related to special education and family school partnerships. After their presentation, we'll turn to two veteran California educators, Manuel Rustin and Jeffrey Garrett. They co-host All of the Above, a show on YouTube that looks at complex issues in education with what they call an unstandardized way. It's a really an interesting program and definitely worth watching and we'll include the link. Manuel is a Pasadena Unified High School history teacher and an advisor to the State Board of Education's Instructional Quality Commission. Jeffrey is Senior Leadership Director of, at the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, which is a pro nonprofit in district partner of LA Unified. Let me turn it over to Bree to start our presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. It is great to see you all virtually. Uh, my name is Bree Dassault, and as John mentioned, I work with the Center on Reinventing Public Education. Um, before we get started, I, I just want to also thank um, John and the whole EdSource team for bringing together um, by far the biggest gathering of folks on a webinar that we've yet to present to. Um, we're really excited to get this time with you and also just huge thanks to Jeffrey and Manuel for joining us. Um, we really upped our game knowing that we have YouTube stars <laughs> co-presenting with us. So we're really excited to spend the next hour or so with you all. Um, I, we will go ahead and start into some of our findings. Um, and uh, 
let's see. So you've had a chance to meet um, all of the three presenters and we'll each be taking different portions of um, a relatively brief deck to just orient you to some of our learnings. Um, we hope to do about 20 minutes of talking and um, also be doing some Q&A. Um, we are, as John mentioned, in listen-only mode. Um, so we want to ask that you submit panelist questions via the Q&A box and that you submit any technical questions via the chat box. Um, what we'd love to cover with you today is just an overview of what research we've done to date, let you know what we've learned so far, go into a couple of examples, and end with some considerations for us to all be thinking about. Um, and then hopefully we'll move from there into some really good discussion. Starting with our research approach, um, what we've done is we have assembled a comp relatively comprehensive database of 82 districts and 18 charter management organizations across the country. Um, they collectively serve about 9 million students. So these are larger districts. They tend to be more urban. Um, and we assembled this list through uh, membership in the Council of Great City Schools uh, Charter School Growth Fund portfolio or um, referral or recommendation for specifically innovative practices. So it is not a representative sample and uh, it is tell important information about what's happening in the country, but it's certainly not all of the districts in the country. Um, what we did is we started about two months ago um, tracking these districts and then what we do, we look for publicly available information um, via their websites and social media channels. And we then update every week what's happening with those districts. So we've been able to see how things have been changing over time. And that's what we wanna share with you today. At uh, kind of by the numbers at high levels, I mentioned we have 82 districts, 18 CMOs. Um, you'll see that our district sample is a broader sample um, and it's just in general a much larger average um, organization. So more states are covered in our district sample and uh, the range is quite great. Uh, they go from relatively small, again with the, the vast majority being larger and the average at 110,000 students. Um, comparing that to the CMO average, which is just 12,000 students. So here's some just high level summary findings, and then we'll dive deep on a couple of these points. Um, first of all, I think it's important to note that almost all districts at this point in the year are providing educational resources to families, and a little more than half are providing what we would consider to be three tiers of a more comprehensive remote learning plan, which would be formal curriculum, instruction, and progress monitoring. Um, Interestingly, I think the attendance and grading uh, practices are still taking shape and are not quite as pervasive. Um, districts, there's no question, um, we've probably all been living this, uh, they are figuring out internet connectivity and devices with um, a fair amount of problem solving going into devices in particular and a lot of efforts to both fundraise for and distribute often tens of thousands of laptops to students. Um, generally supports for students especially needs are superficial and not clear in terms of what's communicated doesn't mean that it's not happening but it it is not something that districts are putting a lot of information out publicly about um, we are finding that remote learning plans are differing by age groups um, generally secondary students will get more instructional time and sometimes more curricular resources than elementary students um, about a third of districts will delegate responsibility or decision making for what a remote learning plan would look like to schools rather than keeping a consistent expectation at the district level. Um, and sometimes there are clear expectations and sometimes there are varied levels of expectation when they delegate. Um, and then lastly, you know, I think one of our, our biggest findings and it's not really surprising, again, I think a lot of us are living this, is just a, a lot of learning in remote learning requires and needs parent support and participation. So diving into some of these points in a little more detail, um, as I mentioned, more than half of districts now provide comprehensive learning plans. And if you look at this column to the far right, what you'll see is that uh, about six weeks ago on March 26th, only 5% of districts were providing curriculum, instruction, and progress monitoring, and now 59% are. So it's a pretty significant shift, and this has been week over week. Districts each week more and more are uh, augmenting plans and providing more and more resources. It has kind of plateaued and stabilized um, as we approach the end of the school year. 
Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, attendance tracking is a really critical tool to track student access, but it is not widely uh, done at the district level. Just 29% of districts and 56% 56, 56 of the CMOs that we reviewed um, are telling us that they're tracking attendance. Um, something interesting is actually in Florida, uh, five out of the six districts that we reviewed there do monitor attendance. And we've learned a lot from looking at how they're using that, that data to not necessarily just track that information, but to actually problem solve, troubleshoot, and find missing students. Um, Miami-Dade is a great example. They rolled out their attendance plan on April 6th. Um, they measure it by how many students are logging into their online learning platforms. And uh, every week, they have their staff, instructional staff and um, on the ground staff actually make phone calls and do home visits to students who have not logged in. They now have 99% of their students um, have logged into the platform and uh, their average daily attendance is at 92%, which is um, says something considering they're a 300,000 student, very high poverty district. Um, and finally, what I'd say here is that states definitely play a role in attendance tracking. Um, and so we're seeing really different behaviors from states. Some are directing districts to just count all students as present and not to track specific attendance data. Others are waiving attendance policies or penalties that may come with tracking attendance. And then others are actually recommending that attendance be tracked. Um, and a few, like Wyoming, are requiring it. Um, similarly, school systems taking, are taking different approaches to grading. Um, here, about half of districts and CMOs that we reviewed are providing grades for all of their students. And again, it's really different. Some districts, such as those in Florida, and most of the CMOs that we looked at, are using kind of similar standard grading practices um, of standards-aligned mastery-based grading systems. Um, other districts are giving or collecting grades, but they're on t uh, very different scales, uh, such as a pass-fail, or all students get an A, um, or only um, collecting assignments if they are improving a student's grade for the fourth quarter. Um, the last point that I want to make before passing um, this over to Lane is that something that we're really interested in as well that we're seeing are some um, districts and CMOs are redefining teacher roles and responsibilities, and, and I would say even really just general staff roles and responsibilities. Uh, we think that this is something that is likely to be an important strategy moving into fall um, planning, uh, just given resource alignment and allocations. But uh, one way that we're seeing this is um, organizations having teachers divide and conquer. So in some organizations, teachers will actually work in pairs or triads. Uh, with one teacher being a lead instructor, another teacher being um, kind of lead on student grading, check-ins, one-on-one supports, and sometimes having a third teacher who has a special ed background. Um, one example, Achievement First has one teacher per grade level across the network assigned for leading instruction. Um, and the other teachers are working on helping prepare lessons, doing student check-ins, grading, et cetera. Um, and at DSST, uh, advisors are responsible for all of the weekly check-ins with, uh, with students. Um, somewhat similarly, there's a lot of teacher collaboration happening in some networks. Um, teacher leaders are at Rocketship are recording um, lessons, and then they're actually leading professional development for each other across sites. Um, and then at a common, they've uh, taken um, their best teachers and they have grade level instruction channels um, led by teachers so that the rest of the network and actually any student across the country can access and use. Um, lastly, Achievement First uh, has shared some information that we thought was is interesting in providing an example of how an organization or a district or a CMO might think about defining roles a little differently. They put a lot of thought into, it's actually an internal document, but uh, put a lot of thought into naming kind of what a maximum required on time is, naming where things need to be uh, permanently or, or rigorously um, followed and where there's flexibility for staff and naming that certain staff may have more demands at home than others and building and bridging um, kind of working partnerships so that folks are helping out if needed with their peers. 
I'd now love to pass it over to Lane to talk us through some of our final findings. Great. Thanks. Before we do, just a reminder that CMO is a charter management organization. That's what the uh, initial stand for. We had uh, a couple questions. Go ahead, Lane, please. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. Um, yeah, so I was on the, I am actually on the team of research analysts that is, has been looking at all these districts on a weekly basis. And one of the things that, one of the first things that we were looking at was connectivity. And as you can imagine, it was quite varied across um, the districts that we were following. Um, you know, some districts had one-to-one -one devices. Some of that was only happening in the secondary uh, grade levels. And so some, some districts we saw connectivity sort of happening in a phased approach where it first started in secondary and then later, a few weeks later, it would go into elementary. Um, but a lot of times, as, as you can imagine, this was a big struggle for a lot of districts and continues to be a big struggle. Um, as far as Wi-Fi and internet connectivity, that also we did see, you know, a lot of some innovation that was happening in regards to how to get internet out to families. One example is, you know, some, some districts are providing, you know, one-to-one -one hotspots for families. Other districts, uh, like Austin, for instance, was uh, deploying um, school buses with Wi-Fi connectivity out to some of the you know, apartment complexes and um, neighboring areas that um, were having some challenges with connectivity. So um, as uh, Bree and John mentioned, my background um, is in special education and family research. And so I've been doing a lot of work in the area of just looking at looking at these websites and seeing what's publicly available for families. And, um, you know, sadly, you know, as you can imagine, the special education information that is available publicly is still pretty sparse. Um, you know, our center has looked both at the state guidance and what's provided, and that falls into a couple different categories. The first is just legal guidance, and that's basically what we've been seeing on district websites, too. It's you know, uh, something very basic, um, turning us to uh, the federal guidance in regards to special education. Um, the second is just, um, you know, information about special education needed to be included in remote learning plans that districts are rolling out. And the last are just ready to use resources. So I would say for the most part, you know, most of the states that we have looked into are really focusing on that legal guidance perspective for uh, districts and schools. Um, some are, you know, requiring that special education be included in those remote learning plans. And then, you know, a few others are, um, you know, rolling out some resources that are uh, some things that educators can be using as they're, you know, rolling out their virtual um, related service and special education plans. Um, we do have a, a, a website and a database for the state level data on our website as well that I'll refer you to. Um, but I would say just overall, um, you know, there are some bright spots. I would say that, um, you know, I looked at San Diego's Unified's um, just uh, website and it, it is very family friendly, I would say, and it has a lot of great resources in regards to special education. I've looked at pretty much all of the websites that we've been following and I would say that San Diego's is probably the most robust. It has a lot of information around uh, assistive technology, adaptive PE, music therapy, related resource uh, service provision, mod and severe. Uh, there's a whole website for moderate and severe and what that looks like. Uh, but I would say that that's pretty much an anomaly. We're not seeing that very often um, across our sample. And as Bree mentioned earlier, um, you know, I also have been interviewing a lot of families about their experiences. Um, I'm also, um, you know, have four kids at home of my own remote learning. And so it's been, um, you know, I agree, it's a lot of this is falling on parents, but what I have been encouraged about is that as I'm talking with parents and educators, just that how important that partnership is and how that communication is really, really important. So this isn't happening um, all the time, but I would say that um, for me, that's the bright spot is how is this changing the relationship between families and schools and how important that really is because we each have a very important role to play in um, how this is all going. And I, now I'm gonna turn it over to Bree for a moment to talk about Miami-Dade, and then I'm gonna pop back in to talk about Boulder Valley. Bree, you're on mute. 
Yes, there we go. So yeah, so we wanted to walk you guys through just a couple examples. And these are each districts or CMOs, uh, charter management organizations that we have um, been profiling over time. So Miami-Dade is the first example we thought we'd walk you uh, this group through. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it has over 300,000 students, about 400 schools. Um, and we've been tracking them closely because they seem to be doing a, a pretty good job of looking around the corner and anticipating um, needs and taking a, maybe as proactive a stance as you could imagine being able to take during a crisis. Um, they were able to launch uh, remote learning immediately after closure. Uh, schools literally closed on a Friday and the next Monday they launched remote learning. Didn't go perfectly. They worked out their kinks, but they still had something happening literally um, one school day following closure and they used the first week or so just to, to work through mostly technical um, kinks and needs to make and build a stronger system. Um, they've distributed over 100,000 laptops um, and uh, phones enabled with Wi-Fi so uh, students who don't have internet at home can access the internet and they've paired this distribution strategy with their attendance collection data so that any student who is not present um, once they can locate and find that student or their family if the reason why they weren't present is technological then that's when they get a laptop or um, a wi-fi hub they uh, mostly use for remote learning they primarily rely upon online curriculum i think that is part of why they were able to move so quickly into online learning. Um, they have very clear expectations on their uh, site and in communications going out to families just of what families can and cannot expect um, at this time and same for teachers. Um, so uh, and actually they have a section for students as well. So they've tried to be super clear about what um, this period of time looks like in terms in terms of folks actions. Um, they have some some of their expectations for teachers include um, that teachers are developing standards aligned lessons. Um, it's recommended that um, teachers work with students through lessons that are about 45 to 60 minutes a day. Um, teachers have office hours. Uh, I believe it's around three hours a day is the expectation, um, where during those hours they're facilitating online lessons and answering questions um, of students and parents. Um, they all use an online platform. They recommend Teams, but, but teachers can choose an independent platform if they like. Um, and they use those platforms to both communicate and to upload content. And um, the teachers are expected to also just communicate grades and progress monitoring on a regular basis. Um, as I mentioned, they track attendance every day. Um, I've mentioned the 99% of students have actually logged in to the platform and 92% average daily attendance. Um, and right now what Miami Data is working on is actually their summer and fall learning loss prevention plan. So they have a summer school program set up where they will be recommending students with um, high absences or uh, low grades uh, to get prioritized um, seats in summer school. They are providing um, online support to ninth graders who have to take high stakes tests their ninth grade year to help them start to get ready for that. And they've committed to trying to start their school year early in um, July or early August to start to support students with acceleration measures who may be behind so that by the time the regular year starts um, on a typical standard calendar year, uh, those students will hopefully be on their way to being caught up. So they have done a lot of work. And as I mentioned, what stands out to us about Miami Dade is just how much they're trying to see around the corner and get ahead of, um, of needs that are in the present moment. And I'd love to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Stephen Wilson, to talk us through Success Academy in New York. Okay, great, Bree. So Success Academy, obviously a very different animal uh, here in New York City, uh, the largest charter management organization in the city with 18,000 students and 45 schools. I think many of us uh, have heard about success for a long time, uh, kind of eye-popping Proficiency levels 99% in math on a very difficult uh, common core state assessment uh, and 90% in ELA. So I had the great uh, fortune to, to embed in success kind of as a student for a few days and to experience their virtual program, which they launched just one week after uh, the schools were closed in the city. Uh, I will say that one of the great strengths that they had going is they had a very strong student culture to begin with. So it was relatively easy to 
adapt those expectations to the new virtual environment. Unlike so many uh, schools and districts which are ratcheting back to uh, three uh, hours of instruction or so often baked into collective bargaining agreement side letters, a success uh, has insisted on continuing with essentially its normal schedule from nine to four in middle school and nine to 530 uh, in, in high school. Um, and it's live synchronous instruction throughout the whole period. It begins with a morning meeting, uh, creating community, children being heard, uh, solving problems, preparing for a successful day. And then boom, at the first period, the teacher is on and they are rolling. Uh, it is high, high, fast paced, high expectation, tremendous focus on what students are actually producing. Uh, through the tool of CAMI, students are doing their work on screen with a stylus and the teacher can see everything that the student is producing. So if they're looking at a, they're doing a close reading of a poem, for example, the student can see everything that each child is jotting if they're solving a, a geometry problem, all of the steps of the proof are laid out there for the teacher to see and the teacher can see the progress of the students, how many have moved on the next problem so and so on and can narrate issues as they're emerging in the student's work. Obviously a tremendous lever of rapid student progress. Uh, so it was, um, it's very impressive uh, and no diminishment at all uh, in expectations of, of work. Um, Eva Moscovich, the outspoken founder and CEO of Success uh, has termed that an abdication of her responsibility. Uh, so the, um, the program continues really with very little difference from its physical uh, manifestation. Uh, Brie, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so that's it for success. Happy to go into any additional detail uh, in the Q&A section. Okay, thank you. Um, so in essence of time, I'm going to breeze through these um, a little bit uh, quickly, um, but if you have any additional questions during the Q&A or afterwards, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so Boulder Valley School District is one of the school districts that I've been following, and like Miami-Dade and Success, they rolled out their remote learning plan quite early, af um, right after spring break. Um, they, I believe, it seems like they're one of the first districts that have rolled out a comprehensive plan and sort of stuck with it. Um, both, you know, some school districts had just rolled out something comprehensive for secondary and then the elementary was to follow. Boulder Valley, on the contrast, has uh, rolled out for all grades at the beginning. And um, the, they were also the first ones that we were following that were really starting to think about summer and fall planning and put that out there on their publicly available website. So um, you can see there, you know, they're starting to think about assessments and what needs to happen for remediation and in order to pre prepare for summer and for fall. Um, there's not a lot of details about it, but they are, uh, they were the first to identify that there's a need for that to happen. I do really like their website. Um, you know, it came out um, quite early, to, um, coming out with unique times call for unique measures is what they called it. I feel like it was a very family friendly website that clearly identified what the role between, uh, what's the role of the family, what are the teachers going to be doing. And, um, you know, I, I assume that that's probably uh, contributing to their success is, you know, being able to clearly identify what each um, party is going to be doing during this time. So as we, um, you know, right now we're really just sort of seeing over the last couple of weeks, um, some school districts that we're following um, coming out for considerations and talking about summer and fall planning. Um, right now, it's it, there's not a lot out there, but people are starting to think about different scenarios because, you know, obviously we know that, you know, we probably are not going to be back business as usual next school year. Um, it's probably going to be some combination of in-person and hybrid schooling and we need to be prepared for all of that. So in order to do that, we need to seem to be very clear about teaching and uh, role expectations. And um, you know, we did the best that we could given the situation right now, but there's just a lot of planning and clarity that needs to happen. Um, we need to have clear decision-making protocols, guidance from states, communication norms, and have platforms in place. 
I mentioned when I was talking about Boulder Valley, um, you know, we need a good and common diagnostic and assessment platforms in order to be able to uh, do this um, next school year and during the summer and additional training. And I would mention that I am following Sacramento um, as a district and I do think that they have um, one of the best training sites that they have uh, available. Um, it's different phased, it's self-paced, and I just think we need to put out more uh, training resources for educators in order to prepare for fall. Um, you know, we also know that there's going to be a lot of health and safety concerns that need to be addressed, and a lot of planning that's going to be required in order to just determine how this is even going to be possible for the next school year. Um, you know, we talked a lot earlier about attendance tracking. Um, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be happening in that area and then grading and credit recovery and what that's going to look like. I think this, I'm um, turning it back over to Stephen to close us out. Okay. So, uh, Bree, the next, the next slide. Okay, so I think that as we as we think about uh, this experience and we look forward to the next piece, I think our our takeaway that this is no time to lower expectations of students or teachers. Uh, time on task continues to matter enormously. Uh, districts that bargain to a three or four hour day are basically abdicating their responsibility to educate. I, I really think it's quite shocking and disturbing. There is no compassion in low expectations of students. Obviously, there has to be enormous understanding and engagement with the extraordinary hardships and trauma that students and families are experiencing. Um, but the default position should not be to reduce expectations, but rather to engage each situation individually. So I think it's, um, it's truly alarming uh, what is happening across the country. And it's not isolated to a particular city, but of course other places have taken a very different stance. For example, in Rhode Island, the clear expectation from the governor on down was we're going to teach. Um, and, and, uh, and that was readily engaged by uh, the Rhode Island Teachers Union and that has been the stance that they have taken. So these, re these responses vary dramatically. Uh, the critical components of uh, effective distance learning, it seems, are daily synchronous engaging instruction. Uh, anything short of that is going to be substantially less effective. And so that's what we need to do. Obviously backed by a cumulative sequential and ambitious curriculum with um, very uh, intentional uh, progressive pedagogies. Daily feedback on student work can't be emphasized enough. If we're not looking at what students are actually producing in detail and doing a daily analysis of that production, we're not going to move kids. And uh, individual daily check-ins, I was mentioning success earlier, there is an expectation that every teacher in the lower grades uh, spends at least 10 to 20 minutes individually with each child, which if you add up that time period ends up being a seven hour day doing just that. Uh, and accountability needs to be preserved. We're seeing across the country, especially in large urban school systems, a decision to take away all accountability of staff. So teachers cannot be observed, evaluations cannot be held, and clearly no organization intent on performing can function under such rules. So that strikes me as another form of complete ab abdication. Uh, and similarly of students, there's no compassion in relieving students of expectations. That's simply uh, condescension. So attendance taking, assignments, and grading are imperative. That's how we show that we believe in them, that they can do things. Um, and so I think that can't be stressed enough. An extensive time for teacher grade team meetings and PD we see in, in many of these uh, side letters uh, between management and unions that meeting time for teachers is being reduced to no more than one hour a week. Well, obviously there's no hope of developing effective instruction and great teaching uh, at le that level of engagement in professional development. So I think that it's, um, it's very sad to see these almost parodic stances being taken in schools, and I hope that we can reverse that and follow the examples of some of these very inspiring cases we saw today. 
So uh, please visit our site at SERPI um, with your thoughts and questions and for additional information. So I want to turn this over to Jeffrey and Manuel for the uh, perspective of the nation state of California, uh, particularly uh, where you are in LA and Pasadena. So you've heard a lot today, uh, quite provocative. What, what was your, what's your thought? What are your thoughts having after what you've just heard? Whoever. Yeah, well, maybe I'll start. And first of all, thank you, uh, Bree, um, Lane, and Stephen. Um, when, we, when we got the invitation to be a part of this conversation, I, I think we were both uh, really fascinated because, at least to our knowledge, the database that you have compiled was, um, was the first of its sort that we had seen, at least, and I think is, is really filling an important void in the conversation, which is what are people doing? And, and in this moment where everyone is trying to figure out a new normal uh, is giving us a great data set uh, to, to draw from. So thank you for the work you're, you're doing on that front. I think, um, you know, as is often the case in conversations about education, I find myself agreeing with, uh, with some things and really wanting to, to challenge others. Um, and there's two, two major things I think that are standing out to me. One is um, actually the, the last point I think you were making, Stephen, around the, the need for collaboration time uh, and meeting time for teachers and educators. And the, the most consistent thing that I'm seeing across the board with schools here in LA and then all of the educators I'm speaking with and convening with across the country uh, is that uh, there are almost no schools and districts that would ha have self-described as being in a, in a really strong place of readiness uh, when this change happened. And um, everyone is trying to figure out um, how to do their best and under really difficult circumstances. And the reality is the kinds of agreements that are, that are, that are certainly in place in the side letter here in LA um, and that I, I see in many districts across the country, I think are really enshrining a huge barrier towards growth and learning uh, among staff that, that we self-imposed and, and should not have self-imposed. And to the extent that those side letters are gonna continue to govern what, our, what the like infrastructure is of our professional culture going into next year, we've got to change them because one hour a week is, I, I manage a team of three people in my organization and I need to meet with those three individuals for more than one hour a week, let alone a school community of, uh, you know, of in some cases, several hundred adults. And so, um, so that really stands out as something that I think in as much as of course, devices and technology are paramount to anything further in this conversation, we also need to set up conditions whereby people can reorganize how we work together so that we can meet the needs of our students. Um, the second thing that stood out to me, and I'll, I'll try to be quick here and pass it to Manuel, is um, I, I appreciate the righteous uh, sort of energy behind the statement that there's no compassion in lowering expectations. Um, I also think there is, there's a very important, um, and I would argue uh, from a Maslow's hierarchy of needs standpoint, more important other side of that coin, which is there's, from my perspective, no, uh, no compassion in having unfair expectations with accountability that, that can lead to negative consequences for, for kids and families. And so um, in a situation where we know, we knew before COVID-19 that there were vast uh, areas of inequity in our profession, and we know that this has dramatically exacerbated uh, those inequities that uh, our, our first order of business in my mind has to be about doing everything we can to level the playing field before we, uh, before we sort of hold to even our most righteous ambitions around, uh, around maintaining high expectations with any type of accountability attached to that. Um, so I, I'm not saying we, you know, we stop and do nothing, but I think uh, you know, the reality is the playing field is so uneven right now that um, we actually, in perhaps a perverse way, risk even further exacerbating the inequities by pushing too far down the like, we've got to keep the high bar and, and, and uh, hold everyone to those expectations line of thinking. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pause there and hand it to Manuel to share some thoughts. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll second everything that Jeffrey just said. Um, I especially want to, I guess, consider some of my own students. So this is my 16th year in the classroom. And California students, we have a, a great many students who are marginalized in various ways. We have over a million English language learners. I have a lot of foster students. California has, I think, something like 60,000 foster students uh, in public schools. And I know our local, we have several group homes within the attendance area of my high school. And some of the group homes have told us that they are having problems with internet connectivity because certain students, certain people in the group homes aren't supposed to be on the internet at all because of their particular um, criminal cases. And then besides that, just their system can't handle so much internet. So I'm thinking about, for example, a foster student that I have in mind right now, and I'm quite certain that foster student wouldn't be um, allowed to succeed at Success Academy um, because I don't think they take students during the year. I could be wrong on that for sure. Um, and I also think that they just looking at districts nationwide and looking at what what um, each district has done to respond to this crisis. I think it makes sense that districts are all over the place and educators are all over the place because this is a pandemic and I can't allow myself as a classroom teacher to forget that uh, one of my uh, former students who's very near and dear to my heart lost her father just a week ago. So I can't I can't pretend that this is this is normal and I can't pretend that simply moving my in class instruction to a digital platform makes up for anything. So uh, aside from how many hours that I might be um, giving synchronous teaching or asynchronous um, guidance to my students, no amount of hours could really make up for that in-person, in-class connection. So to me, high expectations right now um, is the expectation that teachers tap into their students, connect with them on a social emotional level as much as possible to help them help guide them through this because that's what I think everybody needs, adults and, and kids alike. And in terms of looking at the long-term prospects of teaching and what does that even look like in terms of synchronous or not and, and what does daily instruction look like. I, I recall a few years back, I think it was two or three years ago, there was a lot of discussion about how our graduation rates have, have gone up and up and up, yet achievement hasn't. And some of that was attributed to um, credit recovery, online credit recovery, and making it easier for students to get their credits through online platforms. And that research showed that doing it through these online platforms didn't necessarily boost achievement. So I think it's really important to separate the dis discussion about learning from the discussion about completing tasks or completing assignments or checking in to an, uh, a learning management system. Because a student can check in, you know, I could, I could lay in my bed and check into my email. That doesn't mean I'm really engaged. And as a teacher, it's so difficult to, to know if students are engaged because they could be right there in my Google meet with me face to face, but it's just, uh, it's just impossible to tell where their head is at. And, and I think it's really important. I like the, the shout out to Sacramento where I grew up. I like the shout out to Sacramento for their, their training. Cause I think teachers right now, educators, not just teachers, administrators and, and educators of all forms need as much training as possible right now, because this is such uncharted water. I'm really good with the tech stuff, but I'm not good with, checking for understanding if I have 30 faces in front of me and you know they're looking all over the place because you know a few people are looking right at the camera I'm not good at checking for understanding in that context so I think the emphasis really needs to be on training everybody on how to do the best we can in the fall because it, it makes sense we were caught off guard now but we won't be caught off guard in the fall and we have to we have to get our ducks in a row for sure yeah if, if it's okay if I respond to that real quick you know I think that last point, Manuel, is a really critical one. That in as much as the this sort of vacuum around what schools should look like right now is being rushed to be filled by every vendor on the fa on the face of the earth, uh, and you know, in many cases, offering free products and resources, and that's good. Um, but I think the 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 tough reality is like we're in a tight spot right now as a nation. Um, we were caught a bit off guard. Perhaps we shouldn't have been. Um, and there are some folks who are further ahead than others, but we have a three, roughly three month window ahead of us right now to, to get ready. And, um, and we have a deeply morally compelling obligation to be in a, a vastly better spot than we are right now. Um, so teachers are feeling like they have the tools and resources available. Kids and families have meaningful access, uh, you know, one device, and a hotspot per home may be sufficient or may be wholly insufficient, depending on the community you live in here in LA. And I can imagine that's true in other cities. And also depending on family size and parent work schedule and all of those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's great. We're marshalling resources right now, but the real win I'm looking forward to is, you know, if we launch well in the fall, 
you know, then I will feel, <laughs> feel much better than if we happen to figure out some cool things to do for the last month of school here in, in LA. Let me, um, thanks, uh, Jeffrey and, and Manuel. Let me um, maybe rephrase the critique which you, you stated in the form of a question um, to uh, Stephen Bree or, or, or Lane, whoever, is, which is um, you know, how do effective schools with, this is actually from one of our viewers, how do, how do uh, effective schools with high expectations ensure that students' environmental circumstances don't debilitate a student's ability to participate, which is to say, how do you stay in touch and what allowances do you make or should you make and whoever wants to respond. I can start and then Stephen, if you, if there's anything you or Lane want to add. Um, I, I, and I want to just thank Manuel and, and Jeffrey for raising, I, you put in much more human form this tension point we have across, facing all of us. I mean, every single one of us, the you a teacher or a, a district lead or a parent, we're all facing these, this tension between um, serving, continuing to serve all students, but acknowledging that we're in a completely different time frame. And um, in my opinion, you know, all that coronavirus has done is shown a light on and is exacerbating inequalities, but it's really just shown a light on things that we've all known have been in place and are problems that we're always working to solve. For the, and I, I've actually both as a researcher, but also just as a former school operator, um, you know, recently, I mean, just a month out <laughs> of operating schools, um, I completely understand that question of like, where do you hold um, the student or the staff member or colleague who may have very, very difficult circumstances at home? Um, and, I, and I think what we, and I, I wanna build off Jeffrey's kind of last point that a lot of what, at least from a research angle, what we've been looking at is really just a small period, two months in time in a, in an unpredicted, unprecedented, no guidebooks <laughs> period of like crisis response. Like basically we're just looking at what does crisis response mean and look like? And how much of that is like about preparation that helped make certain districts or classrooms respond better? And how much is just about what you do with what you've got um, in the moment? I think to Jeffrey's point, how we start to think about that profile of student who is managing a lot of things beyond their external, excuse me, external things that are beyond their internal control and often beyond our control within the school system is what we need to be spending the next three months getting ready for. Um, I was really struck listening to, to Manuel speak thinking, and Jeffrey actually, because both of you raised examples of things that require supports that you can't do yourself to run a great classroom. Like traditionally, like when I was a teacher, I knew that if I did my lesson plans and I had my relationships with my students and my families and I tried my best and I got better, I could run an okay classroom, hopefully. But right now we need to know that students have laptops, they've got internet, we need to know that they have a safe home, that if their parents are frontline workers or going through economic impacts or personal impacts or are li living in um, transitional housing, that all of those factors suddenly become front and center because that is their classroom all of a sudden. And so um, the, what I, we don't have answers of what exactly it should look like, but I think what I would say that I have a strong opinion on is that the work of this next two to three months is to identify through the lens of equity of our most vulnerable learn what the types of external barriers are and then what role each of us play at the different levels in a system to mitigate them. Um, one brief example would just be, for example, ideally, districts would not be needing to solve all of the internet connectivity issues. That is not what districts were put on this <laughs> um, in this country to do. We are doing it, districts are doing it, but ideally you would see some state or civic solution working in partnership with that. That would just be an ideal so that districts could focus on supporting teachers, supporting students and families on a lot of different fronts that Manuel and Jeffrey have already mentioned. Um, so I think what we want to see is that kind of um, planning and that unified support, usually under like a directed vision, and we're going to need to see it at the state and district and classroom and school level, um, as well as honestly, education advocates and researchers and parents and families as well. The last thing I'll say, and then and I'll, I'll be quiet, <laughs> is that I do think that the summer provides a really important time for the most important priorities for districts or schools or charter management organizations to be piloting 
good ideas and just see if they work. Um, because it's an actual chance to kind of fail fast. And it's what we ask our kids to do all the time, which is try. And then if you don't get it right, try over. And we're actually very blessed, I think, to be in this period of time where we have a chunk in the summer to innovate um, most important uh, trial ideas and see if they work out before we start school in the fall. Thanks. We, we have a number of questions re for regarding parents. Um, how are schools supporting parents to be co-producers at home for their children's education? In your, in your viewing of what's going on in many districts, do you see that as a component of effective districts and schools? I can take that if you want. Um, yeah, so I've been um, doing a lot of research with families and, um, you know, I would say one of the most important things um, is first that I was going to mention as Brie was talking is the teacher check-ins and how that's been so important. And so I've really, um, my own personal experience, so I have three kids with disabilities and so sometimes there's just things that get in the way and sometimes it's connectivity, health issues, like there's a lot going on right now. And so I think that those check-ins are really, really powerful and they've shifted and um, for for our family it's been really really important and I think it's it's the check-ins both both with the student themselves but also the check-ins between uh, the school and the family and that's just been a critical piece and the, the families that I've spoken with have just talked about how how important and um, you know how that that relationship has really strengthened um, and so but you know I think what we all need to be thinking about is that there's still a lot of families because of many issues that educators are not able to reach right now. And so how do we be able to, to do that for all families? Yeah, John, is that, if I yeah. may chime in on this, um, you know, I think the this question really highlights, um, I think something that's emblematic of this entire situation, which is we're learning some really cool things that that just the change of circumstances is uh, is giving us opportunities to explore in a way that there wasn't the will to do before. Um, and we are seeing just the full extent of the barriers uh, and the equity challenges that we really need to grapple with um, uh, fundamentally. So on the one hand, um, the, the organization I work for, the Partnership for LA Schools, has done um, a bunch of outreach with families to really kind of survey what are the needs and what are the barriers that are getting in the way of them connecting with school. And um, I, I think one of the outgrowths of that is really seeing schools think more creatively about what parent engagement needs and, and can look like. And um, families, conversely, uh, feeling like, I know my kid is supposed to be in school, and I'm not 100% clear on what that means, so perhaps a little more initiative on the part of families to be proactive in seeking that out. And, uh, and one might argue that in some ways we're seeing greater levels of regular family engagement now, at least for those families who are engaged, than perhaps we saw before this situation. Um, on the other hand, you know, what we realized in doing that outreach is, is the extent to which food insecurity lack of access to devices and internet, whole neighborhoods that are not serviced by major companies like you know, Verizon and AT&T, et cetera, um, that are essentially uh, like sort of urban deserts, even in the middle of LA in terms of connectivity, right? And the options available for families. Um, and, and then especially at the younger grades, uh, the challenges that we have in carrying forward school where kids are not developmentally ready to be self-sufficient with devices and where then the, the parental ability to lead the learning um, is, is huge, right? What the parents' comfort in teaching the children, the language uh, gap that can exist between home and, and schools, all of that comes into play. And so, uh, you know, we have both a great opportunity and like a real sobering reality, reality to confront there, I think. Um, I'm just curious, Manuel, what have you seen as a, as a teacher, uh, good practices among your peers that you think others should pay attention to? Yeah, I think right now, I mean, we've always known the importance of um, curriculum being responsive to student interest and being uh, and highlighting student choice and student centeredness in your curriculum. I, as a history teacher, I've had to tap into that um, extra, extra strong during this period. And, and the teachers around me who've been doing really well have done the same thing. Um, so for some students, being disconnected from school obviously comes with great pain because they love their teachers, they love their peers, they like being there. Uh, for other students, they show up to school and they, they feel 
not positive about it. It feels like a prison to so many students. And, you know, we've discussed on our show the discipline gap. And of course, we uh, see disparities between how students with disabilities um, are treated and when it comes to discipline and things like that. Um, and black students as well. So for some students having the, so myself, I've been giving students a choice in terms of um, what activities they would like to learn and what activities they would like to do. And for some students, they actually appreciate that a lot more than showing up to school. So, um, so to answer your question, flexibility with the curriculum where possible, where, I mean, if I'm a, a, a history teacher, there's so many different ways I could have students learn about primary sources. And some of that could be tapping into their own community. You're at home with your grandparents now for more hours than you're used to tap into them and interview them and do this assignment. So uh, flexibility and student choice and student voice assignments that meet them uh, where they're at in terms of their interest and tap into the community resources if they are at home in their community unable to come to school to get instruction from us. It, it seems that team teaching um, and, and professional development and also working with teachers working with each other to, to share lessons plans and to actually record perhaps uh, uh, videos that other teachers use. Uh, I mean, certainly Rocketship and others do that. And how important uh, is that? moving ahead is as a as a standard standardized practice you think districts should do any thoughts if i could just jump in on that one um i think that's super important i think uh, it's one thing to talk about um disparities amongst the student population um there's tremendous disparities among the teacher population too some teachers have been in the classroom since well before devices at all and not every teacher is as comfortable delivering online instruction as others so i love seeing in, in the deck uh, examples of schools where maybe it's a few teachers who put together this video on this particular task or this particular strategy and multiple classes use that same video and go from there so that's what we're doing at my school site is in my history department the few of us that are very comfortable on camera are are leading the con or planning to lead the concrete instruction in the fall and have other teachers use those same video resources and then check in with their kids as was uh, recommended, um, check in with their students all day, every day, as much as possible. Yes, and that's not going to happen in one hour a week. So uh, just to reiterate that point, we need the, the structure in place that supports good professional practice that's going to get us the outcomes we want. I think you could make the argument that um, it's how the summer um, is used to help get teachers prepared and s sourcing. I would say probably teachers need to source <laughs> this them themselves to um, to get ready for the fall. What we're really what we've been thinking a lot of, and I, I'm sure a lot of us on this webinar are as well, is the fall presents. It's almost like this perfect storm of conditions where if we don't do things differently, we can't do things. We cannot just do what we used to do last school year about the same or a little bit better, we have to actually do things differently because of um, the circumstances where you have some students who will have had up to six months of learning loss, socio-emotional trauma impact and more socio-emotional needs and mental health needs, re likely reduction in resources and budget, potentially staffing, how we assemble our people to not burn out and to actually do less with more is going to, I think, make it or break it for, um, for our kids. Districts that have been particularly effective in dealing with the social emotional needs of students, any, any uh, jump out? Stephen, Bree, Lane. Well, I would just say that um, if we really care the most about the social emotional condition of students, we will allow them an experience to feel academically successful if we stop teaching them, they're not going to feel good about themselves. So um, I think that when we endlessly reduce expectations, uh, what we're doing is exacerbating inequality horribly academically, and we are psychologically damaging children. One school that is taking a socio-emotional approach um, that we've just started to look at is it's actually just one school, it's a one school, charter school called Impact Public Schools. But I do think that if you're curious, um, it's worth looking, um, looking them up. And we could actually, if, it, if it's an in, of interest, we could send out some informational materials on them just because they are getting attention. Um, they do um, circles, which is a socio-emotional strategy um, that their students have done a lot of training in. Um, they still do those remotely, even down to kindergarten age. 
um, and they do um, things like all family radio hours and a couple of kind of creative things that are uh, probably a little bit more developmentally appropriate for younger students. And I did see one comment naming that this felt like it was more geared towards elementary than high school. So just to build off that, I would say that I think that um, what we were describing here absolutely applies to high school. And interestingly, we've seen less um, less mandated instructional time for elementary than for secondary, um, often probably because of anticipated um, just uh, developmental different, you know, reasons for younger students um, that may or may not be true, but might be part of why, um, why districts aren't actually doing as much for elementary. Now, I know that beyond the 100 districts that you uh, looked at, you also looked at many smaller districts, and many of California's districts are, in fact, small and rural. And I'm wondering, if, I think you looked at 400, I think you said. I wonder if there's any tips or guidance from that that you could offer to some of our smaller districts. We actually haven't. So we have a second data set uh, that another team is working on right now of 400 districts, and those are a, they will form a representative sample that are representative of districts across the country. And so they will have, um, from a research perspective, predictive power. Um, we actually don't have those results finalized yet, but they will come out, I would expect within maybe one week or so, um, what, at most two, but I think it'll probably come out within the next week. Um, I don't have any firm points to comment on. Um, what I could say is that the trends look somewhat similar um, and what we'll be able to do with this data set that we can't do with with the 82 districts that we spoke to is um, look at demographic differences across poverty uh, race geography etc great well we'll look forward to that and uh, again we'll include your website link uh, in our materials so uh, it's getting a little bit past two i'm i wish we could go up two more hours um, but I'm wondering, many states suspended their uh, standardized tests, and so I'm looking ahead, again, we're look, everyone's looking ahead to the fall. Um, from what you've seen with effective districts, have uh, others, uh, have they made use of, good use of assessments, particularly, I guess, in math, uh, to identify where, where the learning loss that we know is happening, and, and perhaps even have uh, ways to address that when students, presumably, come back in the fall, any guidance that you've heard? Anybody? I am happy to take it unless if Stephen, you have any interest. Okay, <laughs> that's a negative. <laughs> um, I, uh, we have been talking a lot about this question on diagnostics. I also, I mean, honestly, would I'll try to be brief so I can pass it over to Manuel or Jeffrey as well to see if you guys have um, more on the ground perspective, but you know, I would say that, that we, we do believe that the, diag the role of the diagnostic is to identify information that schools, teachers, districts, potentially states can use to help quickly fill gaps so that these inequities that have been kind of exacerbated and blown even wider can close at a faster pace. Um, I think that sensitivities to that are just making sure that there's not over assessment or like losing the first half of, you know, month of the year just to assessment. So I've heard of some networks saying they're going to actually try to do some of these um, over the summer or in the month of August um, prior to school starting just so that teachers can hit the ground running with data prior. Um, there's talk of trying to wrap things up this spring with some assessments um, kind of in the same vein. Um, I think there's a question of what are the best assessments. There is no perfect assessment. Um, I think we are of the, of the mindset that don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, that there are, I mean, almost every school uses some form of a diagnostic um, generally to move just at, the, at any t traditional year. Um, and there may be an opportunity here to find a better diagnostic because there's such attention on this, but um, there are a number of different options out there um, and we've also been hearing that in English language arts, you know, really assessing reading level seems to be the most important, um, at least point of view for, for at least some um, systems. And then in math, doing a more comprehensive um, assessment. And I would just add, I, there needs to be definitely a mental health and um, socio-emotional assessment as well, just to see how we are deploying counselors, community support organizations, et cetera, to help students um, with different needs they may have at home. Thank you. Jeffrey, Manuel, any, any thoughts on 
Yeah, I, to me, this is one of the most exciting questions about this period of time, because I, I think we actually have a fantastic opportunity to remove a little bit of the cloud that has hung over the, the sort of dirty word of assessment in our profession uh, for far too long. Uh, and, you know, the, the root meaning of assessment is to sit beside. And I think we have both a like morally compelling uh, reason and a just like logistical reality of needing to reintroduce uh, our schools into a better version of distance learning or hybrid physical and distance learning than they experienced this spring to kind of relaunch school to sit beside our students and say, where are they and what are the needs and how are we going to respond to those needs? I think it was the right decision from, uh, from the state of California and other places in the country to, uh, to eliminate high stakes uh, standardized assessments this spring. I know that can be a controversial take, but I think that was the right call. Um, I think some of the experiences that the, the college board is having with AP exams right now might um, reinforce that. Um, and, uh, and to refocus our energy around assessment on some of the things like Bree just mentioned, right? Um, really understanding from a diagnostic perspective where our students at, doing better progress monitoring and more active use of real-time data than is, than is typical in most schools across the country and by most teachers. Um, and it's kind of changing our professional conversation about the, the important aspect of assessment, which is less about where are they in June and much more about where are they right now and then what are we gonna do tomorrow and next week um, to respond and, and taking into account the kind of cultural consideration uh, or contextual consideration of what's happening around us. Well, thank you very much. It's been a enjoyable and informative hour uh, and to continue the discussion we will provide a link to the center for re when reinventing public education and check out their database and to hear jeffrey and manuel we'll give a link to all of the above which is good watching too and uh thank you for your interest in watching this, we have a record number of people on this webinar. We will post the recording and the PowerPoint and other information, and you can sign up for EdSource's newsletter and other information as well. Uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you again soon.